Hello and welcome to Moon Day 2020. I'm Bruce Bleakley. I'm a volunteer here at the Frontiers of Flight Museum and I'm standing in front of the museum's newest major acquisition, an authentic replica of Spaceship One, which is hanging in the museum's new space flight gallery. Spaceship One was the first privately funded spacecraft to carry a pilot into space. And in this presentation, I'm going to walk you through a short history of privately funded space flight. There have been, and still are, many different privately funded space flight initiatives, including North Texas's own Beale Aerospace, which in 2000 developed and test fired the largest liquid fuel rocket since the Apollo program, and is the subject of an extensive display in the museum's new space flight gallery. Incidentally, don't be fooled by the size of that model of Beale's proposed BA-2 launch vehicle, the actual rocket would have been almost 240 feet tall. For this presentation, we're going to concentrate on four major milestones in privately funded spaceflight. The first to reach space, the first to reach orbit, the first vehicle with a crew to reach space, and the first vehicle with a crew to achieve Earth orbit. First, however, we need to define just when it is that you've reached space. There's no specific dividing line where the Earth's atmosphere just stops and the vacuum of space begins. As you can imagine, the atmosphere gets thinner and thinner as you go higher until it becomes so thin as to appear non-existent. The international organization based in Switzerland that sets standards and keeps records for aeronautics and astronautics whose name I will not try to pronounce, defines the beginning of space as an altitude of 100 kilometers, which is equivalent to 62 miles, or approximately 330,000 feet above mean sea level. This is known as the Kármán line after Dr. Theodore von Kármán, who was the first to calculate that that was the altitude at which, in order to generate enough lift to fly, an airplane would have to go so fast that it would achieve orbital velocity of 17,500 miles per hour and go into low Earth orbit. So now that we've defined where space begins for our purposes, let's look at the four milestones that we outlined earlier. The first privately funded vehicle to reach space was called the Conestoga One. It was funded by Space Services Incorporated of America in Houston, Texas, and its design was based on the second stage of a Minuteman missile. It was launched from their launch facility on Matagorda Island, southwest of Houston, on September the 9th, 1982. It carried a 500 kilogram dummy payload, about 1,100 pounds, which reached an altitude of 313 kilometers, qualifying it as the first privately launched vehicle to reach space. The Pegasus is a three-stage rocket built by Orbital Sciences Corporation that is capable of inserting payloads of up to 1,000 pounds into low Earth orbit. It is air-launched from an aircraft that takes it to about 40,000 feet, and it has wings and tail surfaces for lift and stability while it's still in denser air. The Pegasus became the first private spacecraft to put a satellite into Earth orbit on April the 5th, 1990. The first few missions were launched from an Air Force B-52 carrier aircraft. The program was later taken over by Northrop Grumman, who used their Lockheed L-1011 for over 30 Pegasus launches. The most recent launch was on October 11, 2019, but no more launches are scheduled at this time. The first privately funded vehicle to reach space with a crew is Spaceship One, which first flew in May of 2003. Like the Pegasus, Spaceship One is air-launched carried aloft to an altitude of 14 kilometers, about 45,000 feet, by the White Knight carrier aircraft. Both craft were developed by Mojave Aerospace Ventures, which is a joint venture between the late entrepreneur Paul Allen and Scaled Composites, Burt Rutan's aviation company. A follow-on spacecraft, Spaceship Two, is designed to eventually provide suborbital space flights to space tourists through Sir Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic organization. It can carry two pilots and six passengers. Over 600 people have already signed up, and the price of a ticket is $250,000. Suborbital launches for commercial space science missions 
would also be feasible with either spacecraft. With Mike Melville at the controls, Spaceship One flew the first privately funded human spaceflight on June the 21st, 2004, reaching an altitude of 100.124 kilometers. The museum's example is one of six certified replicas, all built by Burt Rutan's Scaled Composites Company. The fourth milestone, the first space vehicle with a crew to go into orbit, has just been accomplished by a company called Space Exploration Technologies Corporation, more commonly known as SpaceX. First, SpaceX developed a powerful rocket booster called the Falcon 9, which had its first successful flight on June the 4th, 2010. They then developed a spacecraft to deliver cargo to the International Space Station, and the first cargo mission launched on May the 22nd, 2012. The name they gave this spacecraft was Dragon. Did somebody say Dragon? Well, yes, Draco. As a matter of fact, we did. Draco, named after the constellation Draco the Dragon, has been helping us out here at the museum during the coronavirus epidemic. He was kind of watching over the place while we were away when the museum was closed, and he's been featured on a lot of our social media posts. To date, the Dragon vehicle has delivered cargo to the space station over 20 times. The next step was to develop a crew-capable version of the Dragon called the Crew Dragon. Its first flight was an unmanned test flight up to the space station in March 2019, followed by a successful re-entry and splashdown. And Draco, you'll be interested in this. The small thrusters that they use to orient the Crew Dragon spacecraft are called Draco thrusters. Small? Well, and the large thrusters they use for the launch escape system are called Super Draco thrusters. That's better. After a weather delay a few days earlier, a Crew Dragon spacecraft with two astronauts aboard lifted off from Cape Canaveral on top of a Falcon 9 rocket on May the 30th, 2020. This was the first privately funded space flight to carry astronauts into Earth orbit. The two astronauts, Bob Bankin on the left and Doug Hurley, docked with the space station the following day. Here you can see the Crew Dragon in its final docking maneuver as it approaches one of the space station's docking ports. The spacecraft's cover is open to expose the docking ring and hatch assembly. As of July 18, 2020, the two astronauts are still aboard the space station with the Expedition 63 crew and will probably return to Earth in the Crew Dragon in August. One significant cost-saving feature of the Falcon 9 rocket is that its first stage is reusable and the most fascinating thing about this, for me personally, is its method of recovery. When I was a youngster, reading science fiction stories in the 1950s, it seemed natural, as described by many authors and illustrators, that a rocket would come down under its own power, tail first, and land on its fins. Even Walt Disney envisioned that in Disneyland's Rocket to the Moon experience in the late 1950s. However, the reality is that this is difficult to do. And so for the first 59 years of human spaceflight, the booster rocket stages that launched our astronauts into space were allowed to fall into the sea. Now, for the first time, the booster stage of a rocket sending a spacecraft into orbit is capable of coming back to Earth, well, actually to a floating platform in the ocean, under its own power, landing on its fins, after separating from the second stage, the Falcon 9 first stage descends tail first back down to a controlled soft landing on an autonomous spaceport drone ship, a modified barge outfitted with a large landing platform, station keeping thrusters, and other equipment to allow the boosters to recover at sea since there's not enough fuel remaining to return to the launch site. The name of the drone ship that recovered the Crew Dragon booster on May the 30th is Of Course I Still Love You, and its sister ship is named Just Read the Instructions. These unusual names are from the names of two starships featured in the science fiction novel The Player of Games by the late Ian M. Banks. We'll wrap up this presentation by showing you a video of a Falcon 9 first stage recovery. 
First, you'll see a side view of the booster landing on the drone ship, followed by a time-compressed sequence of the recovery taken from the booster itself. The actual re-entry and landing takes several minutes. Here you see the first stage after separation beginning its downward trajectory. The slotted fins are deployed to keep the booster oriented properly during its descent. One final note, if you'd like to try your hand at a Crew Dragon docking simulator, there's one on SpaceX's website at SpaceX.com. Just scroll down about two-thirds of the way on the home page. Good luck!